It's hard to look at the recent Battlefront 2 debacle with EA and not be a little awestruck. With the release of Star Wars Episode 8 just around the corner and an exclusive contract with Disney to create all their AAA Star Wars games, EA should have had a license to print money with this game. Cut to Black Friday, however, and the shelves were lined with unsold copies of Battlefront 2. EA had lost over $3 billion in stock value, and they were being investigated by a number of state and world governments. What could have caused this? Was God punishing EA for decades of shady business practices? No, not God, just a couple hundred thousand pissed off gamers fed up with EA's microtransaction bullshit. This incredible show of force by the gaming community has got me thinking about a book I read recently called Devil's Bargain by Joshua Green. Devil's Bargain details the rise of Steve Bannon and the 2016 election, and there's a great story in there about a time when Bannon fell afoul of a gaming community, with many parallels to the current Battlefront controversy. Bannon's had a very strange career path throughout his life. He went from being a Navy officer, to an investment banker, to a Hollywood producer, and then in 2005, he decided to go to Hong Kong to work for a company called Internet Gaming Entertainment, or IGE. IGE's business was gold farming in World of Warcraft. These were the days before gaming companies figured out they could just directly sell in-game assets to players through microtransactions, so third-party companies like IGE started cropping up to occupy that niche themselves. What they'd do is hire hundreds of low-paid Chinese workers to play World of Warcraft all day, every day, in order to generate in-game gold which they could then sell to Warcraft players for real-world money. The whole thing seemed to be a lucrative, if not entirely legal, business venture, and Bannon even convinced his old firm Goldman Sachs to invest the better part of $60 million in IGE. Blizzard frowned on the practice of real money trading, but they were willing to turn a blind eye, so things looked pretty good for Bannon and his company. Blizzard turned a blind eye. The players didn't. Serious anger started to build in Warcraft communities towards IGE, the Chinese gold farmers, and the crooked WoW players who bought themselves an unfair advantage over everyone else. Players started to gather on forums such as WoWhead, Thoughtbot, and Alakazam, all sites eventually owned by IGE, ironically enough. From there, players organized campaigns to shut down illegal real-world trading sites, and they kicked Blizzard into gear, pressuring them to come down harder on gold farmers. There was even a multi-million dollar class action lawsuit filed against IGE by a Warcraft player. The whole episode forced IGE to dump its toxic assets and reform into a new company, Affinity Media, with Bannon as its CEO. Affinity maintained its control over its gaming sites, but it had lost millions of dollars and its gold farming operations were completely disbanded. Bannon never forgot about those gamers who did him in. He looked at what happened to IGE as a testament to the sheer power these online gaming communities have to mobilize and make real changes in issues they're passionate about. Bannon saw in gaming a collection of young, relatively educated, relatively affluent people who are extremely savvy in using new technology to coordinate with each other, and he saw that this could be very powerful in the world of politics. The only drawback was that these gamers didn't really want to get together and change the world. They just wanted to game. The very thing that drew gamers together into these potential political juggernauts also made them by and large disinterested in real world politics. As Bannon got deeper invested in Breitbart though, he would start to wonder how he could get these guys over on his side. Welcome to our multi-part video series exploring the roles and representations of women in video games. Bannon got his golden opportunity in 2014 with the Gamergate controversy. Building off the growing backlash against feminists like Anita Sarkeesian, Gamergate, while not only about ethics and game journalism, quickly became colored by the discontent some gamers felt having their favorite games criticized. Bannon, editor-in-chief at Breitbart News by now, realized he could draft off this discontent and use it to tap some of the political capital latent in gaming. He just needed to find the right pivot point, a hinge to swing all that energy building up against Anita Sarkeesian and Zoe Quinn into his right-wing, nationalist agenda. Bannon found this pivot point. Its name was Milo Yiannopoulos. And, and, and Gaming it takes you in these crazy directions because yeah. in, in a way it's sort of the most all-encompassing uh, war and the most all-encompassing event that's ever happened on the internet because yeah. it brought in everybody, all of the old battles. And 
Hinopoulos took a somewhat condescending attitude towards gamers when he started covering Gamergate, but this condescension came mixed with sycophantic admiration as he courted the movement for Breitbart. In his articles, he painted a very contradictory picture of who gamers are, both a marginalized group of pathetic shut-ins, as well as powerful individualists heroically stemming corruption in their midst. Both simple enthusiasts who just wanted a functional consumer press, and natural libertarians forming the last stand against cultural Marxism totally corrupting the West. You can clearly hear the ideas of Steve Bannon in these articles, as Milo reframed the central gripes of Gamergate in the language of cultural libertarianism and economic nationalism. What started on Twitter as, it's about ethics and game journalism, transformed into, Gamergaters should concentrate on the very real concerns they have and have had for a decade with a press that, swamped with discredited far-left ideology and unintelligent, poorly trained writers, refuses to tell basic truths. Anita Sarkeesian is annoying, became, industry after industry is toppled over. Publishing, journalism, TV, all lie supine beneath the crowing, cackling, censorious battle axes of the third wave feminist and social justice causes. Breitbart's traffic exploded after Gamergate, and Bannon was able to use those numbers of tech-savvy new readers to help him bombard social media and plant his ideas into the mainstream. He used them to shape the narrative around the election the same way he used Milo Yiannopoulos to shape the narrative around Gamergate. There were a myriad of factors that went into Trump's winning in 2016, but one that must be counted is how Bannon was able to harness the political capital lying dormant in gaming communities and transform it into Trump's personal online vanguard, aka the alt-right. Who knows to what extent gaming culture ultimately ended up influencing the politics of 2016. And we're going to start winning again. We're going to win so much. We're going to win at every level. We're going to win economically. We're going to win with the economy. We're going to win. Looking back at Yiannopoulos' Gamergate articles, I kept noticing how he repeatedly emphasized that Gamergate is inherently non-political. He promised his readers not to be like those nasty SJWs. He promised he wouldn't try to stamp gaming with his personal politics, even though that was his and Bannon's intention all along. This makes sense as a strategy, I guess. Gamergate was started largely by people who were sick of having feminist critiques put to their favorite games. People who just wanted gaming to be unmarred by the real-world muck of politics. I don't think this was ever possible on a theoretical level. Politics touches everything in some way. But if there's anything this story shows us, it's that it's no longer possible on a practical level either. Video games are a huge industry, its consumers are a young and growing demographic, and when this community flexes its muscles, it can cause billions of dollars to evaporate. People are taking notes, and even if gamers don't want to see themselves as part of a political bloc, they can't help outside observers like Bannon thinking of ways to exploit their growing power. Gamers are a part of the political landscape now, whether they like it or not, and the only choice they really have to make is whether they want to enter that world consciously and as active participants, or else unconsciously, in the service of someone else's agenda. You're in the game now, suckers. And it's either play, or be played. <laughs>